Morning, Powerhouse. It's good to see you this morning. Been, uh, haven't been here in a couple of Sundays at Bridgewater one week and having the congregational meeting down there, which was a lot of fun. And Maria and I were at the uh, marriage retreat last week at uh, Spruce Lake in Pennsylvania, and that was a uh, lot of fun. And her and I have been practicing our CTRs, and for anybody who's uh, attended that event, you know what I mean. So it was a good time. We were glad to be there, uh, to be uh, back together, to get some alone time, uh, to reconnect with each other. So it was, it was a blessed weekend. But I am excited to be back here this morning uh, to share with you God's word this morning. We are in the third week of our series, Rabbi, which means teacher. And in this series, we've been looking at some of the teachings of Jesus now, sometimes, because we're in a different culture than they were in that time, we can't always fully appreciate some of the nuances of what Jesus was teaching and why it was so revolutionary to the people in that time. And so what our hope in, is in this series is to look at some of the key teachings of Jesus and to see what they meant in that context in the Jewish, to the Jewish people, see why they were so different than what they were used to. And our, and our prayer in doing that is as we have that better understanding of then, it will help us to see how that scripture applies to us today and will revolutionize our lives. This morning we'll be in Matthew 18. We have our ushers, we have the Bibles. They'll throw one at you if you raise your hand. Don't worry, they'll toss it gently. You can open up and uh, uh, follow along there. This morning, I wanted to touch on one of his teachings in terms of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Not always our favorite topic, because it's always very challenging for us in our lives. But forgiveness is so critical to our lives. Our entire Christian faith, all the singing that we just did and the hand raising and the clapping is all based on God's forgiveness. And even though the greatest joy that we have in our lives comes out of forgiveness, it is also one of our greatest struggles. We struggle in asking for forgiveness at times, and we can often struggle in truly giving forgiveness. This morning, some of you are struggling with forgiveness. You're struggling with forgiving someone in your job, maybe a neighbor, struggling forgiving someone in your extended family. Maybe you're struggling to forgive someone who's not even alive anymore or someone who did something to you 10, 15, 20 years ago. Maybe you're struggling with someone in this church. Maybe you're struggling with forgiveness with the person who's sitting right next to you. We all struggle with forgiveness. And it's my hope this morning that we can look at a key teaching of Jesus to help us with that struggle. And I think one of the reasons that we, we struggle so much is that we, we misunderstand forgiveness or our role when it comes to forgiveness. And I just realized that you need to forgive me because I forgot to do announcements. <laughs> Pastor Rob is going to let me hear about that one this week. Just kidding. Okay, can I stop and do announcements real quick? Man, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Good morning. Welcome, visitors. We love God's word so much, we just jump right into it. I don't even remember what I was going to announce. If you are visiting this morning, we do welcome you. Uh, we'd love to know if you visited. You have a Connect card in the seat in front of you. You can fill it out with any information that you're comfortable with. Uh, and at the end of service, uh, we'll take offering and you can drop it in the, the bag at that time. Um, also with any tips on how to get me not to forget about doing announcements. Um, the other thing I want to tell you about is on your way out, we have one of these. Our ushers will have them out there, or, uh, or Kate, or some of our staff. Uh, and they basically say, one cross, one man, in a world that was changed forever. Partly what we'll preach about today. And it just has our times for our Good Friday service and our Easter service on the back of it. And it basically says the phrase, come meet Jesus again for the first time. And our desire on Easter morning is to introduce people to Jesus who may have never met him, or all they know of him is what they've seen on a TV show or what they've seen in a, a magazine. Or maybe they grew up in church and learned about Jesus and, and they ended up walking away. Well, we want to have that morning, that opportunity to share Jesus with them. And so we want you to take one of these cards 
And I want you to prayerfully consider mailing it or in fact giving it to somebody. We even showed you where to put the stamp here. We talk about one of our main ideas here is to impact people and introduce them to Jesus. We can't do that unless they're sitting here in the seats. And you know, I think we talked about this last week, but of of the almost 200 women that came to our women's event a couple weeks ago, what, 50 to 60% of them didn't even attend our church. Now we did not have it plastered on billboards. We did not have a TV, TV commercials going. We did not do a huge ad campaign. Simply the ladies of our church just asked somebody else. Just simply asked, would you like to come? And that's what I'd like to have you prayerfully consider doing. Taking one of these cards, and if we run out, we'll print more. And ask somebody to come to Sunday service. To see their life changed forever. So that they can experience the forgiveness that I'm going to be preaching about this morning. Can you do that for me, church? Amen. All right. Now that we're back from that commercial break, back to God's word. Now, seriously, grab one of these. Grab one of these this morning. Who knows whose life will be changed on Easter just because you chose to hand out a card. All right, let's get back to this. As I was saying, I think one of the reasons that we struggle with forgiveness is that we misunderstand what our role is in forgiving somebody. I mean, to get right down to it, I think our problem is when it comes to forgiveness, we often pause when we ought to pursue. Okay, we often pause when we ought to pursue. And I think it's our nature that when somebody wrongs us or we feel like somebody wrongs us, for us to sit back, wait for them to come to us as we sit in our throne, dispensing forgiveness, and to ask for it. And if they never come to us or they don't come to us in the way that we see fit, then we never give that forgiveness. And it turns into unforgiveness, which can often end up like a prison in our lives because it causes us to put our relationships on hold. You know, because we're waiting for someone else to make it right. And until they make it right, our relationship with them changes. We don't talk to them. We probably avoid them. We may avoid friends of theirs. We may avoid going to places where they're going to be. Sometimes in the church, I've watched people see someone I know that they're having issues with and they'll turn around, change directions, and go the opposite way. All because of unforgiveness. How many of you have seen people leave the church over unforgiveness? Because they sat there and it never came the way they thought it was going to. But that is not the kind of forgiveness that God calls us to. There's a story I was reading this week of a woman in Pennsylvania and her 23-year-old daughter, while at college, got stabbed to death by a man. And the man who did this was caught. He was put on death row. And even though justice was served, if you will, she said that she suffered from feelings of hate and rage for years. She used this interesting phrase that she said she lusted for revenge. Think of the intent behind that. She lusted for revenge. And she said, finally, after about 10 years, no, 12 years, she decided to write this man a letter. And in this letter, she says, I forgive you. It doesn't mean that I excuse you. It doesn't mean that you should not be held accountable for what you did. It doesn't mean that I don't grieve over my missing daughter, my dead daughter, every day. But I have forgiven you. And she said that she went down to the mailbox, and as she dropped that letter in the mailbox, she said it was like all the weight, the rage, the lusting for revenge, it all just started to lift off her shoulder. And she felt a freedom that she hadn't felt in 12 years. And it struck me. I said, I thought to myself, why in that moment was all that hate and rage gone? I mean, it's not like that man ever came and asked her for forgiveness. He never sent her a letter. He never called her. He never sent her an email. Nothing. She had no knowledge that he was even sorry for what he did, other than possibly being sorry that he got caught. So if his desire for forgiveness was not why she went about forgiveness, then what took her? What freed her from this lusting for revenge in her life that seemed to to imprison her? And I think the answer to these questions as I was pondering praying this week, as we'll see in our scripture, is the key that everyone needs to get freed from that prison of unforgiveness in our lives. 
And, and, and if you aren't in this place, if you've not captured this thought, this will revolutionize your idea of what forgiveness is. And I think the key is this, that the mother did not wait. Listen to this. She did not wait for the opportunity to forgive. She created the opportunity to forgive. And in doing so, she found that freedom. To put it another way, she pursued forgiveness. This is my key point here today. God calls us to pursue forgiveness. Not to wait, but to pursue. And it's my hope this morning that God will show you and will show me in every one of our lives where we need to pursue forgiveness with someone else. In fact, I pray during this message as I give out different examples that the Lord will bring to your mind pictures of the people that you need to pursue forgiveness with and that you won't let it pass by, but you allow the Lord to speak to you. To do this, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 today where Jesus teaches, is teaching his disciples about relationships in the church. And he just got done talking about if someone sins at the church, how do you, uh, how do you handle it? What do you do? And Peter asks a question. We'll turn to this in, in uh, Matthew 18 and verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, Not seven times, I tell you, but 77 times. Now, to understand why Peter asked this question, this goes back to understanding the culture a little bit. In those times, Jewish rabbis taught that you had to forgive somebody three times, and if you did it three times, then you have proved you are a forgiving person. You had fulfilled your command to forgive after three times. It's like the original three strikes in your out rule. Now, why Peter doubled the amount and added a half, I don't know. Knowing his track record, He's probably standing around looking at his other disciples like, well, it's time to make myself look good. You know, he goes up and goes, Jesus, so how many times must I forgive? Yeah, I'm not going to say three times, seven times. Yeah, looking around so, the, you know, so everybody else knows this is spirituality. And you see how Jesus answers this. He said, no. Not seven times, but 77 times. And the word that stands out to me here is Not. He says not, not seven times. As if Jesus is emphasizing that forgiveness is not what you think it is. Now, what came to my mind in all of this was Monopoly. Anybody love to play Monopoly? Did anybody used to play, love to play Monopoly, but now you hate it because of what it's done to your family? Yeah, yeah. Donnell, I saw your hand shoot up so quick. That's good honesty. That's good honesty. Monopoly turned 80 this week. 80 years old. 80 is zero. Uh, I, I saw a cartoon yesterday, and it had the Uno game, you know, walking up to the Scrabble game and says, so today I ruined 11 friendships. And the Scrabble game goes, cool, I ruined 12 friendships and three perfectly good marriages. And then in the, you know, the next picture ca uh, caption, it shows the Monopoly game with shades on and says, oh, aren't you guys cute? Come talk to me when you're in the thousands. <laughs> Uh, now, do you guys remember the get out of jail free card from Monopoly? Anybody remember that? Yeah. Now, the, the rules in Monopoly, I don't know if you knew this, but Monopoly actually has rules. No one seems to go by them. Free parking, get money, and all that stuff anyway. Um, but you can sell the get out of jail free card at any time for any price. Now, when I was younger, I used to play Monopoly with my aunt and my younger cousins, and it would infuriate me because she would always sell the get out of jail free card for one dollar to them. One buck. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm going to use this word because I mean it. I hate family monopoly. The let's all play together. Let's all keep each other in the game. Oh, you don't have to pay me this time. No, that's not what monopoly is about. Okay? <laughs> We're not teaching anybody anything good in life about that. And monopoly is about <laughs> learning how to crush your opponent. <laughs> in my wife's family, it's learning about how to cheat effectively. I hope my in-laws are watching. Uh, anyway, but she would always say to me, say, now, honey, those are the rules. I can sell it to them for a buck. Now, I think it's the same way when it comes to forgiveness, that we often want to make somebody pay something or suffer before we will give them forgiveness. We're going to determine what they owe us. 
But God says, those aren't the rules. In Luke 17, he says something similar to Matthew 18. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. If you're like me, you think, well, what about the eighth time? In fact, some of your, um, some of your versions will say uh, not 77 times, but seven times 70. Now, I'm not going to really get into that today for time, because the point here isn't necessarily the amount. The amount is irrelevant from what Jesus is trying to communicate. We'll see what I mean in here in a moment. Now, pay attention to this at the end of this. I rep- you must forgive him. The word must. I think we get forgiveness wrong because we think forgiveness is a choice. But it's not a choice. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, forgiveness is a command. And pursuing forgiveness means the understanding that forgiveness is not a choice. It is a command of God. Now this idea can be hard to swallow for our pride. Because let's be honest, irrational. It is, forgiveness is irrational. It is the most irrational thing we do. It goes completely against our human nature. I mean, every time someone hurts you, for the most part, what's your reaction immediately? Oh, let me forgive you. No, it's to get even. You need any evidence? Married couples, or, or those of you who aren't married in your family, when someone close to you says something mean to you, what do you want to do? Say something mean right back. It's our nature. Show them how they were wrong. To have everybody else see how they were wrong. What's that bumper sticker? I don't get mad, I get? Oh, that scares me. You guys know that so well. I was expecting you all to be confused. Like, well, I, I pray? I, I'm glad I, I am glad I'm preaching this today. Now, Jesus gave us a parable to help, help uh, us understand this. Let's read verses 23 through 30. It says, For this reason, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his slave. As he began settling his accounts, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, because he was not able to repay it, the Lord ordered him to be sold along with his wife, children, and everything he possessed, and repayment to be made. The slave threw himself down on the ground saying, be patient with me, I will repay you everything. The Lord, the king, had compassion on him and on that slave and released him. And he forgave him the debt, the entire debt. Forgave him the entire debt. With that in mind, verse 28. It says, after this slave went out, the same slave found one of his fellow slaves who owed him 100 silver coins. So he grabbed him by the throat and he started to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe me. And then his fellow slave threw himself and begged him and said, be patient with me, I will repay you. But he refused. Instead, he went out and threw him in the prison until he could repay the debt. Now, My initial thought when reading this is, why would this man not show the same mercy as he just received? And I think it's because the man was only interested in saving his own skin, not in forgiveness. And I think sometimes we confuse forgiveness with saving our own skins. Like when you're young and you get caught doing something wrong, you say, oh, I'm so sorry, Daddy. I'm so sorry, Mommy. I remember when I was young, I would say that. I wasn't sorry. I was sorry I got caught. I was trying to save my skin. And when I say save my skin, I'm talking about my cheeks, and I think you know what I mean. (laughs) But in life, when we talk about forgiveness, sometimes we're just we're just not thinking about saving our skin. If we are truly pursuing forgiveness, we're not just concerned with saving our skin, but we're concerned with compassion. Compassion. And just as we read in verse 27, compassion is at the root of forgiveness. Pursuing forgiveness is forgiving out of compassion. Pursuing forgiveness is forgiving out of compassion. And not just any compassion. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians verse, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. In other words, we are to show the same compassion to others as God has shown to us. And Jesus gives us an illustration to understand this. 
what Paul is saying. You have this man who owed 10,000 talents. That would be like millions of dollars literally today. Millions, if not a billion dollars. He owed a million dollars, and he had just had it forgiven, saying, now nah, you don't need to pay it. And then he finds this man who owns him 100, gold, uh, 100 silver coins, which was worth about $2,000. So he just got saved millions of dollars, and he is choking a man over $2,000. I mean, this would be like someone coming up and forgiving your $500,000 home mortgage, saying you don't have to pay, and then you sending out some debt collector named Tiny to break the thumbs of some guy who owes you five bucks. It makes absolutely zero sense. And this is the point that Jesus is trying to make. It makes zero sense not to forgive somebody in light of what you have been forgiven. What could someone possibly do to you that you could not forgive? I mean, no matter how horrible, how painful, frankly unspeakable things that people can do to one another, none of them come anywhere close to spending eternity without God. None of them. Nowhere close. Because of God's forgiveness, you have the promise of eternity with Him. You have a hope and a purpose far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. What could be greater than that? God's forgiveness has brought that to you. It is the measure by which we should co show compassion to others. We have to ask ourselves, what do we require of people to forgive them? Is it in line with what God required of us? Which was absolutely nothing other than receiving his forgiveness. Pursuing forgiveness means that you understand forgiveness is a command and not a choice. And it is a command that is born out of compassion for others because of the compassion that God has shown you. Another reason that we should pursue forgiveness is because it makes an impact on those around us. Verses 31 through 35. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were upset and went and told their Lord everything that had taken place. And then this Lord called the first slave and said to him, Evil slave, I have forgiven you all the debt because you have begged me. Should you have not shown mercy to your fellow slave, just as I showed it to you? And in anger, his Lord turned to him, turned him over to the prison guards to torture him until he repaid everything that he, could, he owed. And Jesus summed it up with this statement, So also my heavenly Father will do to you if each one of you does not forgive your brother in your heart. Heavy words. Heavy words. Now we have to remember this parable was in the context of how Christians would treat one another. That if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, this is the standard that you are being held to. Every one of us, right now. We have to realize out of this passage that other people are impacted by whether we forgive or not. It's just not about you and the person that you need to give forgiveness to. People are watching. Our coworkers are watching. Our friends are watching. Our family is watching. Our neighbors are watching. Our church is watching. There's always somebody watching. The people that God has called you to share Jesus with are watching. They're watching to see if you really believe in this forgiveness that you talk about. In 1 Colossians chapter 11, we are reminded to be imitators of Christ. Imitators of Christ. Because pursuing forgiveness or not doing it impacts so many people. I think of Maria and I with our kids. Kids are like sponges. We've talked about that. It's not always a good thing. You see them repeating things. You wonder where they got it, and you, then you realize it was from you. But it can also be a great thing. When you see them saying, I forgive you to each other. You see, our kids are going to watch how Maria and I model forgiveness to one another. And how we model forgiveness is how they're going to learn to model forgiveness. Now that's one example. There's about 100,000 examples we could give today about how you're either pursuing forgiveness or not pursuing forgiveness is going to impact 
your witness in your life from your job to your church to your friends to your neighbors to your family. The stakes are too high, church. They're too high for us not to pursue forgiveness with one another. Because if we don't, we end up like the man in this story. We end up in a prison. A prison where we avoid places and people and events because we don't want to have to deal with the people that we haven't forgiven. We feel awkward. We feel restrained. Forgiveness is like a get-out-of-jail-free card, as Rob put so well this week. Unforgiveness is like not using it. And some of us, we don't use it. We sit in unforgiveness because sometimes it means that we're going to have to admit that we're sorry too. Or it means that we're going to have to dish, deal with emotions and things from the past and issues that we just don't want to deal with. And you know who loves all of this? The devil. He loves when we do not forgive one another. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those that believes that the devil is behind every problem. But I do believe the devil tries to speak into every problem. And every issue that comes in your life, he wants to make it as bad as possible and rip you apart from one another. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is encouraging his leaders to forgive. And here's the reason that he gives. He says, we got to forgive so that we may not be exploited. Listen to this word, exploited by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. Pastor Noel got it right. The gospel is war. And you are the enemy. The enemy is after you. Make no mistake. He wants to rip apart your relationships. He wants to rip apart your marriage, your family. He wants to rip you away from every person that you may be able to share Jesus with. He wants to rip this church apart. We cannot be ignorant to his schemes. What would happen is every time we, we start in, in a bad situation with somebody, a bad relationship, and we start to hear that whisper, and, oh, what did they do to you? I can't believe they treated you like this. Who are they to do this to you? If we said no, that's not the line of thinking I'm going to go down. We cannot be ignorant to the schemes of the enemy. Have you ever been thinking about a situation with somebody and just out of nowhere all these negative thoughts start coming in your mind and you start getting all just tensed up and you start getting built up and your blood starts to boil just out of nowhere? That's why he talks about in Scripture taking every thought captive, saying, no, I'm not going to go down that road. I'm going to pursue forgiveness. I'm not going to pursue hate. You know, it's an effective strategy that, that this enemy uses. Because when he's whispering in our ear about whoever we're angry with, we're so busy being angry with them that we have, we're not even paying attention to him. But we have to open our eyes and start paying attention. No matter how bad your situation is with somebody else, they are not your enemy. They are your brother or sister in Christ. And God sees you and calls you to work to come together as what? Not so you can be right, not so they can be right, but for his glory. So that people will see how we handle our relationships, how we handle ourselves, how we give forgiveness so freely, and it will cause them to praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Have you ever thought about this? that your ability to forgive other people can help lead someone to Jesus Christ? You ever thought about that? It's a humbling thought. Because when I think about forgiving somebody, I just think about them understanding how they were wrong. But no, there's a bigger picture. So how do we keep this from happening? We need to pursue forgiveness. We cannot... Look at forgiveness as a passive action where we sit and wait. We need to pursue. Christ says that we are to pursue. Now back in verse 22 of Matthew 18, he's using this te a teaching method here called hinting. 
in the Old Testament. If you're around Jeopardy, here you go. It's called hinting. And it's where rabbis will use a phrase from the Old Testament and use it to make his point in what he's talking about now. And you read the phrase here that Jesus says, not seven times, but 77 times. This is found only one place in the Bible. Genesis chapter 4. And it is, uh, it's in reference to a man named Lamech. And Lamech is a descendant of Cain. Remember who killed his brother, his Abel. Let's look at what uh, Lamech says here in verse 23. He says, you wives of Lamech, hear my words. Husbands, I dare you to go home and, and yell this out to your wife. <laughs> wife of Jeff, come here and listen. <laughs> I can't even look at her. <laughs> He says, you wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man who hurt me. If Cain is to be avenged seven times as much, this is referring to a promise that God made to protect Cain after he killed his brother, then Lamech 77 times. In other words, anyone who crossed Lamech would have been paid back big time, not just seven times, but 77 times. Now, once you understand this reverence that Jesus is making, you understand the contrast here. He's saying, just as Lamech was eager for vengeance, the followers of Jesus Christ need to be eager for forgiveness. Just as Lamech was vowing to pursue, to put punishment on anyone that hurt him, punishment that far exceeded the crime, that we should pursue to forgive people. For, forgiveness that far exceeds what they deserve. Pursue forgiveness. This is what it means to pursue forgiveness. It means you realized all that God has forgiven you. And you know all the junk that each of us carries and that he continues to forgive all the deep down thoughts and actions and words that nobody else hears. They're just in your heart and mind. And that he didn't wait until you came to him to ask for forgiveness. What does it say in Romans 5.8? In in Romans Why we were still sinners, Christ did what? He died for us. And in that humility, you realize whoever has offended you. You don't know their whole story. You don't know their background. You don't know what they've gone through. You don't know how you've, you may have misinterpreted something always. But none of it matters, even if you did. I'm going to choose to show compassion out of my love and honor for God out of my desire to show that same compassion to this other person who is made in God's image just like I am. And so that I will be a witness to everyone around me that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. And that maybe, prayerfully, it will give me the opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. And then it means taking an action to follow that up. God calls us to pursue forgiveness. Bow your heads with me, if you would. I want you to just listen to my words. Stay, stay with me, if you would. This doesn't mean that it's going to be easy, that you're going to feel like forgiving. It doesn't mean you're going to have trust immediately, that there won't be consequences, or it's even the end of discussion. It means that you choose to forgive in your heart. And that compassion would be displayed by how you speak about the person that you have been, how you act towards them, how you think about them, how you pray for them. You pray for the people that you need to forgive. This morning, I, with your eyes closed, I want you to simply ask yourself, is there anyone that you need to pursue forgiveness with? I mean, think of all the people that you are odds with in your life. I pray God will show you where you need to pursue forgiveness. Maybe it's just telling a spouse that you're sorry. 
Maybe it's showing them an act of love to know it's okay whatever they have done. Maybe for you parents, it's telling your children that you're sorry for how they've tre you've treated your mother or your father in front of them. Maybe it's smiling and saying hello to somebody who really feels bad or they, they did something to hurt you and you let him know it, it's okay that you still want to know them. Maybe it means calling an extended family member who you have had rough times with. Maybe it's being the first to say that I'm sorry to someone. Maybe it's someone who you can't even speak with anymore, that they're, that they're dead, they're gone. Maybe it means even writing a letter to them, a letter you may not even mail, but telling them that you forgive them. There are a million possibilities. But I pray whatever God, one leads, you, God leads you to, that you would pursue for forgiveness. In fact, this morning, if you need to pursue forgiveness with somebody, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to just look at me. Now, it doesn't mean I'm going to remember even who you are. I probably will forget most. But it means that you are signifying that you need to pursue forgiveness with somebody. And it's a physical act saying, Lord, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to pursue someone. So just give me a look if you need to pursue someone. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, praise God. So many eyes I see. Oh, God, do a work in their lives. Do a work in my life. Father, show us what it means to pursue forgiveness. Help us to have the courage and the strength, the humility to take that first step. Help us to swallow pride. Help us to show love, Father. Lord, I pray for people in here today that aren't struggling with pursuing forgiveness. I know that there's someone in their life that probably does. I pray, Father, that they would help those people to pursue forgiveness. Lord, what an amazing day would be if every piece of advice that we gave to one another when we were going through hard relationships was advice to pursue forgiveness with one another. What an impact that we would make for Jesus Christ. Pray, to you, pray you'd speak to their hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.